Well, it is Christmas time. Mariah Carey is on every radio station. And we together at Anchor Church are in a new series called Adore, where we get to come and adore Jesus. I hope that you enjoyed last week as we started this series off. Today, we're going to be talking about a vision of peace. I'm looking forward to hearing from God's word today on the peace that he offers during this holiday season. You know, as a kid, a dark memory stands out to me. I was hanging out in the living room and looked at my Christmas tree and wondered what had happened. Well, the night before, my cat had crawled up into the tree and batted away the top part of the tree. Well, for many years, we only had three quarters of a tree. That's another reason why I don't have cats today. Yet, for some reason, Christmas was full every year. The same traditions, the songs, the family time, and the focus on Jesus. Well, you might be feeling like Christmas is a little incomplete this year in 2020, but know this, if your focus is right, you can have a full Christmas. Hey, we're so glad you are joining us at Anchor Church, and we pray that today you will be blessed and that you can also respond in faith. If you make a decision, if you need prayer, if you want to go further in your relationship with God or start serving in some way at Anchor, click the icon, contact us at anchorchurch.com for your appropriate campus. And we'll get in touch with you and follow up with you. You guys have a blessed, blessed week.
Merry Christmas, Anchor. So glad that you guys are here. Uh, so glad that we get to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, as a father of a youngin, uh, I can attest that there's nothing more peaceful than a newborn sleeping. One, because it's absolutely adorable. And two, the parents actually get to sleep. But keeping that in mind, the peacefulness of a sleeping newborn, we're going to get ready to celebrate and worship our Lord and Savior with a song about when he was born and the peace that he brought to us. So go ahead and prepare yourself to worship. What child is this? So many great elements come to light as we look at the Christmas season. You know, we celebrate joy, we celebrate uh, Jesus is coming, and so many different elements. Uh, today, as we spend time looking at God's Word, we're looking at a vision of peace. So before we walk in that time of the sermon, as we're looking at peace, let's take a moment and let's watch this video as we rejoice in the Prince of Peace.
Hey, good morning, Anchor family. So glad you're here today. <clears throat> I, I really mean it today. I'm, I'm so excited today to bring this message as we talk about through our series of door, looking at a vision of peace today. Uh, one of the things that every single human heart is just constantly aching after is the peace, uh, peace that we just need. Uh, there's so many different things that war against that peace, try to bring us down, but uh, the human spirit really just needs that peace. And so I'm so thankful that one of the attributes, one of the elements that we get to look at as we rejoice in the Messiah around the Christmas season is this element of peace. Uh, today we're going to look we're going to spend some great time digging that and looking at what it means for the Christian now so we can have peace in who we are as we live in this world and also look at the eternal peace that's coming when Jesus sets up his eternal kingdom. So I hope you'll join me in that and I hope you get your Bibles ready, get them open to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to spend the bulk of our time there today looking at these things. You know, we look at when we uh, look at the Christmas season, we see a lot of different elements. We see uh, decorations. We see uh, hopefully Christian elements because we're celebrating the birth of Christ. We see that in the nativity. We see that in bells. We see that uh, in certain things like you know joy. Uh, but peace is always one of the ones that comes to the forefront, <clears throat> and I think that's uh, not an accident. Uh, just as I mentioned before, this is something that the human spirit really just desires. It's, it's a need that we have in us, and so I'm so thankful that Jesus brought that, and that one of His titles for us is. Prince of Peace. You know, people, uh, when you talk about peace, think about it in a lot of different ways. Uh, we think about, of course, as inner peace, uh, you know, being content in ourselves. Uh, a lot of Eastern religions that focus on meditation and things like that are searching for inner peace. They're looking for contentment in life. And uh, as we talk about inner peace, we're talking about kind of a rest in the person a settledness, a contentedness that is there where you're, you're not working against yourself, you're not working against God, you're not working against others. Uh, we seek this because the human soul is consistently discontented. I don't know if you've ever noticed that about yourself. You know, even as a Christian, I, I still war against that, to be content in who Christ is and what he's provided for me. My, my spirit still chases other things, thinking that's going to make me at peace when that's just a fleshly, foolish thing that I do. Uh, the human spirit searches for peace. We want that. And so uh, we often we seek it through different things. We seek it through through people, through possessions, and we seek it through uh, through power, whether it's things we can have, things we can own, things we can be in control over. Uh, people think often, you know, what they find it, uh, that that's going to bring them peace, but not realizing that that just wears out when it's not the true source of peace. Uh, and, you know, lack of peace can lead people into a lot of different stuff. It can lead people into using drugs. It can use them into fits of anger, to outbursts, to, to just a lifetime of depression. Some terrible things can come from lacking peace. Another way to think of peace is uh, thinking about external peace, like, you know, literally being at peace, not being at war. <clears throat> you think about being at peace with others, maybe not warring with the people in your family or warring with the people that you work with. Perhaps we even just think about, you know, being at war with other nations in the world. Uh, in 1968, uh, a writer named Will Durant wrote that, uh, at the time, that uh, in the last 3,421 years of recorded history, only 268 of those years have seen no war. That's 8% of the time. 8% of recorded history is the only section where, where there's no, no war recorded anywhere in the world, where people were, quote, unquote, at peace. That's 8% of the time. That's hundreds of millions of people have died in wars like that. So there's a lot of different ideas about peace, inner peace, outer peace, peace with God, peace with people, peace among the nations. Uh, today we're going to look at what ultimate peace looks like here. Uh, we know, hopefully, we know as Christians, and if you don't, I get the blessed joy to tell you about this, uh, that uh, it's only in God's eternal kingdom where we get to experience that true kind of peace that we desire. We have it in some measure now because of the Holy Spirit, and we'll explore that in just a few minutes as we look at the scriptures here. Uh, but we will not experience full peace in its fullness the way God designed it until his eternal kingdom is set up. Uh, peace is promised in, in, chap in things like uh, Luke chapter 2, where we see the angels pronouncing to the shepherds out in the fields. It says, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Peace among men. Imagine it. Peace among men. Not fighting with your neighbors. Uh, peace among men with whom he is well pleased. When the shepherds were, that was announced to them, that was the enactment of God's plan of salvation to bring peace into the world to some measure here and eternally, of course, through his eternal kingdom. And the way we start to get a great picture of this, the way we're really going to understand this is by going back to where God enacted it, where he started to tell us about it 
where he didn't leave people in the dark. And darkness is a big thing we want to look at today as we talk about peace. So turn in your Bibles again. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. And we're going to go through here. I'm reading through the ESV. So the verses should be up on the screens. It should be on the U version notes there. But uh, read this along with me. Starting in uh, chapter 9, verse 2 says this. says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Say that with me. A great light. We have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness. See, darkness is a big thing here. Uh, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy of the harvest and as joy uh, they're glad as they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Every boot and trampling warrior uh, in battle tumult, every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. This is some fun verses here we're talking about, right? Uh, verse 6 goes on to what we're more familiar with, though. This very, very famous Christian passage, or Christmas passage. For to us a child is born. A son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, uphold it with justice, with righteousness, from this time forth, forevermore. Look at that, from the start for where he pronounces it, through evermore, through the end of all time, here into eternity with Christ. Uh, he will establish it, he will uphold it, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Uh, that, that's a huge chunk for us to try to take in, and I'm so uh, excited to see all the peace here because church, if some of this kind of went over your head, we're going to look at it. There is great peace to be had. I hope if you're walking into anything, any expectations today, you're going to walk in expecting to find peace because God has provided it for us. And so let's explore that. Let's, let's dig into this because there's quite a bit to cover here. This great passage shows us something that we already know, something that we're celebrating right now. It's the time of the Messiah coming, where God will redeem his people uh, eventually from their bondage and they go into captivity here, but eventually and fully for his people to be freed from sin, to be set free from what's going on there in our rebellion to God. It speaks of his eternal kingdom. And they seem, uh, it's very interesting in this, this passage actually because uh, a lot of people war with it because it seems like Jesus didn't do everything they thought he would do. He would uh, come and set up peace, that the world peace would be here. People wouldn't be warring anymore uh, when they don't understand that Jesus actually had his first coming here, which we know he came uh, in the year approximately uh, 0 AD is where we kind of you know set our calendar. Uh, we think back about that time when Jesus came. Uh, uh, but we don't. a lot of people don't understand that when he ascended, that the eternal kingdom is still yet to be set up. He's still doing the work now. He's still bringing people into the family. So there's this gap in there. We're living in that gap right now as we look at this time that's coming. But we're going to put all this together so we get the clarity that we need to have to really understand why we shouldn't just walk in peace because it's a Christian thing to do, but truly because the Prince of Peace has provided it for us. So let's look at this, just breaking them down. Starting in verse 2 here, we see that these people were at war. They were walking in darkness. Uh, they, they were walking in darkness, lost from God, uh, and we see that they were at war with God through their sin. They were at war with themselves through selfishness, and they were at war with other nations. Uh, these people who walked in darkness were far from God. That's what darkness is talking about here in the Bible. When it says uh, those who lived in darkness, it's talking about those who conducted their lives in darkness. That's what walked means in the Bible. Nearly every reference in there, unless they say, hey, they walked to that place, Walking means the lifestyle that you live, the way, the, the way that you're going through there. So these people who lived in darkness, who walked in darkness, lived their lives in that, uh, were rebellious to God. In the scriptures, darkness actually means quite a few different things. One, it means, of course, darkness. It's literally, it's just dark outside. But the other connotations that always go towards man's relationship with God, for instance, it says uh, you know, that sin uh, is likened to darkness. That's rebellion to God. Darkness is spoken of as captivity in the Bible, usually in connection with Israel's captivity and going into bondage of sin. There's, there's a darkness that's spoken of in an ignorance of God, where if you don't know about God, you don't know who the true God is, you walk in darkness because you have not seen the light. And we know that Jesus told us that he is the light of the world. So in him, we walk in the light, but to be away from God is to walk in darkness. This here was spoken to the Israelites to let them know, you know, these people who walked in darkness, but there is also an eternal implication here for it. It has implications for every single person who walks the earth because every single person has walked in darkness. 
Every single person has walked in rebellion to God. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single person who has ever walked this earth, with the exception of Jesus, has sinned against God and offended him in such a way that they need redemption. They walked, lived in darkness. But we see that a great light is coming. It says all have sinned against God. You know, Walking in darkness is walking in rebellion, living in rebellion to God. I think darkness is a very apt thing because when we think about the dark, we understand that dark is a scary thing. When I, uh, when I was a kid, we used to go uh, exploring through like drain pipes and stuff like that. And one of the times we were pretty deep into the cavern of the, of the, the, the drains there, our flashlight died. We were worried, right? You know, that the light matters to us when we talk about those things. Uh, darkness is a very, very intimidating thing, especially when we talk about sin. Uh, you know, if you're lost in the dark, there's nothing else in the world that you would give in that moment than to have light. I highly doubt you're checking, wondering, man, I wonder what my Facebook friends are doing right now. You're not thinking about how hungry you are. If you're lost in the dark, the only desire you have is going to be for light. And that's the story of a, a man named Harrison O'Keen. Maybe you heard his story. Uh, back in 2013, uh, this man was working on a boat off uh, the coast of Nigeria, and a huge storm came up and sank the boat and literally killed every single person on board, with the exception of him. Uh, as this, he tells the story in the providence of God, he doesn't say the providence of God, but I see the providence of God. Uh, he tells the story. He was walking out of, of the restroom when the ship uh, began to go down, and a burst of water pushed him up towards the front of the boat as it sank down. It's this large ship, multiple people on board. He's pushed up into this air pocket, into the front of the ship, in total darkness, and he sinks down to the bottom of the ocean. And for 60 hours, two and a half days, this man stays in the darkness. He was able to stay alive by sipping some Coke. Somehow he found a, a two-liter bottle of Coke. But as he sat there, two and a half days, 60 hours, contemplating the darkness in pitch darkness, hoping for deliverance, as, and as every moment ticks, he's, he's more and more hopeless. Every moment he realizes, this is it. This is the end. What's going to come? I, I don't know what's going to come. Am I going to run out of air? What's going to happen? Total darkness, total loss, total depression, total, total lostness, and total lack of peace until a light shone in the darkness until a rescue diver who had gone down there fully expecting to just do a recovery mission to, to pull the dead people out is terrified when he gets a tap on the shoulder from Harrison who says, I'm alive. Light shone in the darkness and brought all the hope in the world. Imagine the peace that would have flooded that man as he saw that light shining in there. And that's the same kind of peace that we experience as we talk about the light shining into the darkness. A true hope that is going to be had for the people. People that walked in darkness, had no hope of light, are now having a light shone on them. And that's what we see in the Messiah. That's what we see in Christ coming to us. Until that time, you know, uh, Harrison was walking in darkness, but seeing that light was his salvation. And, and that's what we see here. Those people who walked in great darkness have seen a great light. Say that with me. Have seen a great light. I hope you say the same thing. You know, when I walked in my past life, I was walking in darkness. I was lost. I was going the wrong way. Christ's great light, the light of the world, shone on me and saved me. For those living in darkness of life, a great light has shone. Imagine being like, like Harrison, being that guy who's just trapped on the road, but not being in literal darkness, being in spiritual darkness, where you can't connect with God because of sin, where you're constantly discontented in life because you don't have the true source of peace, where you find yourself all the more discontent because every single time you search for it in a person or a new relationship or in a new product or something you buy or some deal you find on Amazon or something comes in your life. This is going to provide me peace every time it lets you down. It's because it's not sourced by the real source of peace. The people of the land, the people of the day, even the people of the day, you know, they say they were walking in darkness, but a great light has come and illuminates them to the peace that can be had. And such a great relief is this that verse 3 expands on it through some great examples for us to tell us what it really looks like. We see him give two different examples in here uh, of multiplying joy that came as a direct result of the peace. And the examples he gives is in the reaping of a harvest and in the spoils of war. He says uh, in both these verses here, he says, uh, you have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy, they rejoice before you. How? as with the joy of the harvest and with those who divide the spoil. Both of these examples are meant to clarify to the reader and to the people of the day. This is a peace that is fully realized. It is not a hope that peace is going to come, though we have that hope. It is a peace that is now fully realized. Jesus told us, we'll look at it more later, my peace I give to you. 
it is realized. It's something you already have in your possession, and that's what he's talking about here, the joy that can come from the peace that is there. And he talks about with the harvest. Uh, I am not a farmer by any stretch of the imagination, but I have a, a small garden in the backyard, and so I know the truth of what some of the difficulty is with it. Uh, in agriculture, a lot of things really go into making sure that a crop comes out. For instance, you've got to have the right soil. You've got to till that soil. You want to make sure that no pests come in there. You want to make sure that you've got the right light. You've got the right seed. You've got the right temperature. You've got uh, the right fertilizer. And as a farmer, you know, if, if this is your crop, this is what's going to come in and sustain you, you are literally hoping every day. You are praying every day, God, let this produce a crop. Please let this be a solid harvest force because if you don't get that harvest, you starve. There was no running to Walmart, no running around the corner to the Smiths. If you didn't get a crop, you did not have food. You were putting all of your hope in the deliverance of this crop to come and be food to you. So if there's too little rain, there's trouble. If birds come through and they pull the crops off, if pests come through there, if you've got bad seeds, if a fire starts and comes through there, there's so many different factors warring against crops. The joy of the harvest comes after that. The joy of the harvest is where the work is done, the crop is in hand. You've gone through the months, the seasons, all, and the crop is in the barn. You've got it. It's realized. It's in your hands. You don't have to think, man, I hope it comes in. You have it. It is fully realized. That crop is there. You've got it. And the same is true of spoils. You know, If you won a battle, you would take the riches from that battle. As you're fighting, you might put a few things in your pocket, but you wouldn't go and start loading things up until after the battle was done. You don't reap the spoils of war until the battle is over. And that's what he's saying here. We rejoice in the peace that has come because it is fully realized. It is in our possession already. Just as a harvest brings joy because you've got it. It's yours. It's in hand. Just as the spoils of war are rejoiced, you're, you're richer now. You're benefited from this. It's in hand. You fully realize it. And that's what he says about the peace of God and the joy that comes there. It is a fully realized peace. After... He talks about this. After he talks about the peace, after he talks about the joy, he talks about this eternal thing that's going to come, a fully realized peace, one in the life of the Christian now in the spirit, but also to looking forward to his eternal kingdom. He turns his attention to more of what that eternal kingdom is going to look like. There's going to be peace there, a fully realized peace, so much so that all wars, all, all uh, fighting ceases. By the work of this prince of peace who will come, wars are set and earthly rulers are overcome. He puts an end to all other earthly rulers and all earthly conflicts. No other ruler will be over him. No other ruler will, will, over, will outrank him. The, the yoke that, that had been put on man before through other leaders and world political leaders uh, are going to be taken down by God. He's going to knock those out of the way. And war won't even be a memory. All those things we push to the side you know, I mentioned earlier, in all of recorded history, there was 268 years of peace. Under this great light's reign, under this Messiah's reign here, there will be no more war. And that's evidenced by what he says in verse 5. He says, every boot of the trampling war <clears throat> and battle and tumult, every garment rolled in blood are going to be burned as fuel in the fire. We don't even need them anymore. We don't need those weapons of war anymore. They're gone because war is gone. There is peace here. Other verses in the Bible describe this peace in a lot of different ways. They say in Micah 4, 3, for instance, it says, He will judge between many peoples. He will settle their disputes for strong nations and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares. We're going to make hoes. We're going to make shovels. We're going to make pitchforks. We used to have swords. We used to need those to fight. Now we just need to till the ground. We're going to beat those things into just everyday garden tools because we don't even need them anymore. He goes on to say, their spears will be turned into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation war, nor will they even train for war anymore. Why? Because peace is here. We don't need to fight when peace is here. There will no longer be any need for implements of war. Maybe they'll take tanks and turn them into playgrounds. Maybe missiles will just be big firecrackers that we laugh at all the time. All those weapons of war are gone because we are at peace by this rule that this, uh, this great light has brought. You know, Isaiah 11 actually tells us that this uh, broadly stretches even into the animal kingdom, <clears throat> into peace for everyone. It says the wolf, the wolf will lie down with the lamb. <clears throat> the, the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling are all together. A little child is going to lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. Look at this. 
The infant will play near the cobra's den. I can take, you can take your little infant and set him down next to him and play with the cobra eggs. Teach him how to juggle. I don't know if you can really do that. But that's the kind of peace that's there. There's been, <clears throat> it's not just a peace among people. It is peace in general. Peace amongst everything. Uh, you might think back, hopefully, to the Garden of Eden where all these animals are there and Adam gets to name them and there's, there's no warring animals aren't afraid of man yet. There's been restoration of the way God initially made it. Just like every Disney movie we've ever seen where people walk down the road and they pick up snakes and they hang out together and they sing with the birds and they talk with the bears. Uh, it's a corny idea to us here, but that's the truth of what it looks like. Ultimate and full peace, fully realized. Now this peace, of course, is fully realized in God's eternal kingdom. It's when he sets up his rule and his reigns, where he comes back, if you remember from our Thessalonian series. Uh, <clears throat> there's coming a time where Jesus is going to bring us home with him. And we're going to look, we're going to live in heaven forever. This is what his eternal kingdom looks like in heaven with him. This will not be fully realized until then, but for the believer, we have an element of this peace now in our hearts that keeps us because of the Holy Spirit, keeps us at peace. We have a privilege that no one else does. We have a glimpse of that peace and we have a bit of that peace in us now that we experience through faith. That's what 1 Peter tells us. 1 Peter 1.5 says, Through faith we are shielded by God's power until the coming salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. By our faith in Him, we have a measure of that peace. We are contented as we wait for that time. We can walk in peace because this great light has come and the darkness has not overcome it. So how will all this happen, though? How will all this happen? Who is this peacemaker? Who is this light? It's the same child spoken of that we looked at last week. Isaiah 7, 14, for the Lord himself will give you a sign. A child will come through a virgin. It's the same child here. John 1, 5 says this light is the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 6 of uh, Isaiah 9 here says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We know because of the Gospels, this light, this sign, this child is Jesus himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given to take away the sins of the world, and we know him as God in the flesh. We know him as living among us in order that he might save us. He is the eternal Messiah, the Savior of men, of all people, and the ruler of all. Revelation 19.16 clarifies for us, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. No one outrules or outranks him. You know, contrary to our, our popular idea or our stereotypical idea of politicians being just kind of bloodthirsty and after their own good and not for the people, uh, Jesus, his rule will be absolutely full of integrity. It will be full of justice, of righteousness in every way. He will replace all other, gov all other government systems. You know, communism, socialism, democratic republics, monarchies, and democracy will all be gone away and we will live in a theocracy where God is ruler over all. He is king, he is lord, he is prince, he is savior, he is master, he is friend, he is father. What a great thing, church. I hope that brings you peace as we think about what he's doing because this is what we celebrate this time of year is him enacting that. When he's in control, things are as they should be. Maybe that's the truth even just to take into your own life today as we think about it. When he's in control, things are as they should be. When you lay your burdens before him and let him take control, you don't pick them back up, things are as they should be. They, they go the way they're supposed to when we trust in the Lord with that. When he's in control, <clears throat> things act as they should. And that's displayed by the titles that he's given here. Uh, we see he's called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Each one of those designations you know, speaks to an attribute of who he is and what he does. For instance, wonderful counselor means he makes wise decisions, not selfish ones. He has supernatural wisdom and he is righteous in every way. When we call him the mighty God, we see him as a powerful warrior, one who is able to do all these military exploits and put away the other uh, military warfare that we saw in verses 3 through 5. And he's not just the warrior, though. He is also God, the warrior. Along with these other terms, we're reminded that it is God who fights for us. When we call him the everlasting father, we know he's the Messiah, will be a father to his people eternally. There is never a time where God is not going to be over us and have care and concern and love and interaction. And the prince of peace just means he's the ultimate leader and the ruler of everything. He will bring peace 
for all of eternity to his people. I don't know what's warring in your life right now, but I hope you'll walk in that and trust in that, that these promises of God, these words of God are meant to bring us comfort. That we will have peace because of what he's done and because of what he's doing. When Messiah comes, he's going to enact peace as the rule of law, not as a mere pronouncement. He's not going to have to write up on the board, right? Everybody, we're going to be nice to each other. We're going to have peace here, right? This is just something that happens when he comes in. When he comes, his presence there sets the stage for the way things should be. No longer will men war with each other or with God. They will be at peace, <clears throat> established by his rule. You know, all four of these titles reveal him as a political genius, as an immovable sovereign force, as an eternally loving leader, and one so powerful that his institution of peace will be everlasting. Be everlasting. Verse 7 goes on to explain that more. There will never be an end to his kingdom nor to the peace he has provided. You know, as we look at history, if we look at even the best of societies and government rules, the best of the best still only lasted a few hundred years. Rome is gone. Greece is gone. Babylon is gone. America, whether we like it or not, is going to be gone. World, world systems, world governments do not stay. They always ebb and flow. Even the best change or go away or overtaken by others. But the Lord, his kingdom will never end. That's what Psalm 145, 13 says. It says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout the generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and all his works. They are eternal. He will rule in peace. He will rule with justice. He will rule with righteousness forever. I don't know about you. <clears throat> That's something my heart just, just desperately longs for. Desperately longs for. I long for peace in the world. I don't want to hear about people fighting and killing others just because they want more land. I don't want to hear about men warring with men. I don't want to hear about people being in rebellion or at war with God anymore. I want to hear about reconciliation and peace. I just love hearing stories from you, Anchor, and from all our campuses where people come and say, Look what I did. I got to share the gospel with someone today. I got to minister with someone today. I got to be a peacemaker between someone today. I love hearing stories like that. And I love that this is the hope we have. I look forward to that. I long for it. <clears throat> and I hope it doesn't surprise you to hear the Lord feels the same way about it. He feels that same way too. It's what drove him to action because you'll see it is God's passion. It is God's love. It is his justice, his righteousness, his own glory and the salvation of his people that will stir him to do this. That's what we see. Uh, verse 7, the last little half there, it says, uh, Peace is not contingent on our working or world leaders, but solely on God's passion, because it says, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. God's passion will do this. God's care for you will do this. God's desire for his own glory will do this. His own zeal to bring about salvation for his people will drive him to do this. And if that doesn't make you feel special, I don't know what will. The love that God has for you drove him to do and to bring these promises, to give those promises now and to bring them to fruition in the future. Peace is you know, not contingent again on your working. It's not on world leaders. It's not on politicians. It is solely upon God's passion for it. In this season, we celebrate his birth because of this inaction of peace, because of this promise of peace. One of the reasons we give so much attention is because he's bringing something that we so desperately need. Peace. It was promised long ago, of course. We saw this in this about 2,740 years ago, approximately. Give or take five minutes. Jesus' birth confirmed it. Jesus' birth enacted it. The Bible tells us at the right time in history, this is when it happened. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says, When the fullness of time had come, when God saw that it was the right time to do this, According to his plan and his purpose, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to do what? To redeem those who were under the law so that we might have adoptions as son. We could phrase that another way, not against adoption, but say, there's going to be peace made. There will be peace there. He will bring us in as children. We are not at war with God if we are his children who are loved and cared for and are being filled by his Holy Spirit. And these kind of truths ought to bring us peace, church. These wonderful promises ought to assure your spirit. Calm your heart. Allow you the ability to rest that despite the struggles that we fight, we can have the peace of God. 
This should bring the believer peace because this is a special and exclusive kind of peace reserved only for the people of God. No one else is able to rest in the peace of God because of their relationship with him. John 14, 27 says, where Jesus is speaking, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, but let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Don't be worried because I am your peace, he says. Don't be worried. I am your peace. Uh, Matthew Henry, a guy I quote quite a bit, I think he was from the 1500s, great pastor, said this. He said, safety consists not in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. The peace that Jesus gives is not the absence of trouble. We know that, right? <laughs> it's not the absence of trouble. It is rather the confidence that he is there with you always. He goes on to say that peace is such a precious jewel that I would give almost anything for it except truth. We seek after that peace. John 16, 33, Jesus elaborates even more for us. He says, I have said these things to you, to my disciples, not to everyone, to my disciples, that in me you may have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation, but in me you're going to have peace. Take heart, I have overcome the world. You see that contrast? In the world you're going to have tribulation. In me you're going to have peace. Where are you walking today? Where are we walking? Are we walking that we're so focused on the trials and the struggles or even possibly the distractions of the season of presents and, and decorating and food and family? Are we so distracted that we're in the world that the tribulation is causing us discontentment? When Jesus told us right there, in me, you'll have peace. If you want discontentment, go out, have the world. Go get it. Chase ever. Do whatever you want. You want to ruin your life? You want things to fall apart? Chase the world. If you want peace, come to me. You know, it's things like this that make me kind of feel foolish sometimes because I always, not always, I go the opposite direction too often. I know these promises and yet still my flesh allows me to walk the other way when church. Let me give you an encouragement that I challenge myself with. May we walk in the peace of Christ today and not in the tribulation of the world. If we have a choice to do so because Jesus said, if you want tribulation in the world, you can have peace in me. Shouldn't we choose the peace? Especially when it's when our hearts are desiring for. We would choose that peace. That's kind of the direction that Colossians gives us as it talks about that. Or Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let them take rule. Why don't you stop letting yourself rule? Stop letting Oprah or Dr. Phil tell you how you should feel about things. Stop reading these blogs that are not sourced by the scriptures. Let the Lord be our peace. Let his peace rule over our hearts and not the newest magazine headline or tagline. The peace our souls so desperately long for can be realized only through Jesus. And church, can I tell you something? You already have it. It's up to you to walk in it. You already have Jesus. I have given it to you. His Holy Spirit lives in us to give us that peace. If you look for it in other places, you will miss it. If you look for it in Him, you will find it in its fullness. Just as when you reap a harvest and it's in hand, you have the same thing in the peace of God as we take that from Jesus. So instead of chasing after these things, can I encourage you to rest in the care and the work done for you by the wonderful counselor, by the mighty God, by the everlasting Father, by the Prince of Peace? Can I encourage you to walk in that? You know, we celebrate his birth because this was the fulfillment of the promise in Isaiah here, we read about the promise, but still, it was 740 years until that promise was fulfilled and enacted. This season reminds us of the incredible love that God showed towards people as he brought Jesus into the world to fulfill that promise of peace for us, for you and for me. That peace for each one of us. We celebrate that peace and we look forward to the eternal peace that we have in the future coming with Christ. We look at the manger in this season, knowing that that's where peace came in, the Prince of Peace came, knowing that someday that Prince would grow up and he would be the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And there's a coming a time where on the earth as well as in our hearts, we will have the complete peace of God. As we look at the manger, we're actually looking forward to the future reign of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and that Prince of Peace. So church, you know, we may have to wait for peace on the earth but we walk in eternal peace of God presently. Let me say that again. We may need to walk in some, a, level, a, a, a different level of peace while we're here on the earth. When we get to heaven with Christ, we have the eternal peace of God. That's what keeps us going. We may have to wait here 
but we still walk in the eternal presence of uh, peace of God presently. Can I encourage you to rejoice in that? Instead of grabbing all these practical applications this week, maybe this would be a, a time for us to rest a bit. You know, the, the, the quarantine is, quote-unquote, quarantine is still kind of locking us down with the stay-at-home orders there. We have possibly the ability to be away from other distractions in the world. And I know it's, it's weighing on so many of you, and we pray for you often, but could we take advantage of this time now? Instead of chasing other things, to letting our minds go out, to sit back and to truly rest in the peace of God. To rest in the peace of God that he has promised to us. Rejoice in him, church. Rejoice in that peace. And can I encourage you, one practical application. Make sure you keep that to yourself. Let's not be stingy with peace. Let's share the peace of God by sharing the gospel with others. This time of year, people need peace more than ever from what's going on in our world and what's going on in the season. Church, we are the light of the world because Christ is in us. His Holy Spirit lives in us to shine that light into this dark world that we live in. It's dark, isn't it? A great light has shown in you. That light is now shining through you. It shines through these sermons. It shines through Pastor Jared, Pastor Justin, all the other guys on the team here at Anchor. It shines through you as you minister to those you work with. It shines through you when you share your faith with someone, where you stop on the side of the road to help someone who's got a car broken down, where you give groceries to someone, where you, you donate, where you... So many different places, church. The peace of God, the light of God is shining into the darkness when we do those things. Can I encourage you? Rest in the peace of God this season and let that spur you on to share the peace of God with others. Let's take that as the challenge today, and let's commit this to God through prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today for this great promise of peace that you, you show us in your word. Lord, we are so thankful that we know that when we uh, come to faith in you, when we confess our sins and you forgive us, Lord, that our slates are wiped clean, and that way we are able to walk in just great confidence, knowing that we are at peace with you. And if we're at peace with you, peace can be found everywhere else. Even in the midst of tribulations and struggles here, Lord, we can still walk in peace because of you. And Father, I pray that peace for, for Anchor Church today. I pray that peace, Father, that your Holy Spirit would uh, help our minds to understand that truth, that you would help our spirits to rest in that truth, and that the Holy Spirit would also convict us, challenge us, charge us, encourage us to go and share that truth. Lord, you are so faithful in every way. We are so thankful for your fulfillment of that promise of bringing peace through Jesus. Lord, we look hopefully to this season because we know we rejoice uh, in what you've done in this season. We celebrate Christ coming into the world. We celebrate peace coming into the world and into our hearts. May we walk in that today. May we rest in that. May we share it, Lord. And may we do it all to your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again so much for being here, church. I, I'm excited every week to be able to share the Word of God with you, and I hope you're excited about it too. You know, uh, if you would take it just a minute here, uh, we've got time. We're not doing anything else right now. You know, we're still at church. You're watching online. Would you take a minute and let us know how we can be praying for you? Let us know ways that maybe this message spoke to you and say, "Man, praise God, Amen." Hey, I love that scripture. Interact with us there. If we've got to be distant for a while, we're going to have our online campus where we're separate. Let's connect through that. Share your prayer requests there. Let us know who we can be praying for and how we can be praying. Uh, you know, you can also ask on there if you want some more information about getting in touch with us about our kids programs that we do on, on weekends with youth group or when we do our Wednesday night kids service at the West Campus online. Uh, you can find about ministry opportunities. We'd love to get you plugged in. Everything that we can do, church, to try to get you closer to Christ, more plugged into the family of God and serving and working the way that we know God would have you do, let us know about that. We love interacting with you like that. Make sure you keep up to date with that. Make sure you share this stuff. I can't wait to see what else God's going to do through this sermon series. And hey, 2020 is, is bleak. 2020 has got great hope on the horizon because of what Christ is doing. I hope we'll walk in that this week. Take that encouragement this week. God bless you. We'll see you next time.